Hi, my name is Sarah Freshly and welcome back to Freshly Read Books. Okay, so if you've seen Ted Lasso, which I'm sure you have if you're watching this video, then you know that the show loves a good reference, especially a good book reference. And not just referencing them, but like making them integral parts of the show. Things that show character development even. Oh, but on the topic of whether or not you have watched the show, there may be some spoilers for season one in this video. I'm not gonna talk about season two at all. So we've got the books here that I am going to be reading for this video. I would like to say that there are technically some other books that are shown for example like Rebecca has some architecture books or something as coffee table books I'm not gonna read those there's ones that are like specific for England what is it called English geezers guide to cockney or something like that I'm not gonna be reading that obviously so I'm gonna be reading these episode by episode so as the books appear in the episodes meaning the first one that I'm going to be reading is the Dharma bums by Jack Kerouac which is the book that Ted is reading on the plane on the way to England so I will check back in once I've read it. Did you know that this was basically a sequel? Because I didn't until I was done reading it. And you know, it would have been nice if you had let me know. So apparently On the Road, Kerouac's novel that I feel like is known the most of everything that he's written, because it was probably the only one I could name prior to reading this book. It's basically about Jack Kerouac, but like, also it's like technically a novel and this is the same thing, but it happens after the first one. So it's kind of a sequel and I haven't read On the Road. Also, I would like to point out that I'm wearing my Yosemite National Park t-shirt that I got last year when I went hiking out there because Ray, the main character, I guess our protagonist, he hikes to uh, Matterhorn Peak. Well, not quite. He doesn't quite get to the top, but he does like hike the trail that is known as Matterhorn Peak. And immediately I had to ask my friend who was living out there for a while if she'd hiked it and she hasn't yet. And then we looked it up and it looks like it's a really hard hike. So maybe one day. But anyways, this book is about Ray who is is just he's a dharma bum which the best way i can describe it is that they are seeking dharma or the truth they like some of the zen buddhist teachings and they're trying to like bring that into their own lives as much as possible but they kind of do it in their own style i guess essentially homeless but not quite because technically like they do have people they could call on to stay with they just choose not to most of the time along with ray who is kerouac there's also jaffe who is his friend who i think introduced him to this whole dharma bum movement movement if I remember correctly and considers himself one as well and then jumping into like where I think the comparisons are between this and Ted Lasso one of the main things I noticed was there's a lot of uh, homeless people in this book or uh, people that they refer to as bums that aren't necessarily dharma bums but people that Ray comes across just based off the way that he is living his life and they are treated much better than I've ever seen homeless people treated in basically any other book. They're treated just as regular people like anybody else. Someone he would talk to, someone he would get information from. And I think just that non-judgmental spirit is also the spirit that Ted Lasso carries. I mean, he even says that quote in his famous dart playing speech. He said, be curious, not judgmental although it is misattributed to Walt Whitman, who actually never wrote that in anything, but it's famously misattributed to him. So it's not like it's Ted's fault. But the core message of that, the be curious, not judgmental, I think is something that Ray kind of experiences within this book. Although I do think that they still get judgmental about normal people. There's like a little bit of judgment that is tossed towards people that are content to live kind of the normal white picket fence style life. We all have our blind spots. <laughs> Secondly, I think the friendship between Ray and Jaffe is a little bit reminiscent of the friendship between Ted and Coach Beard. They're very different people, like very different pairs of people, but the friendship itself is so sweet and so uncompromising. Like they are just such good friends. Also just that these two pairs of friendships both people in them are really similar in a lot of ways, but also really, really different in others. And lastly, the thing that I think is the most obvious that they would maybe be going for by choosing the Dharma Bums to be the book that Ted is reading while he's on the plane, leaving the US for England, is just that it's the start of a new adventure. In the Dharma Bums, Ray kind of begins a lot of new adventures from the hike to Matterhorn Peak to later working in like a fire watchtower. And in that case, he's completely alone in that. That. and in the show he is leaving behind his family and likely feels more alone even though he does have coach beard right there next to him but in particular we see that he is on chapter 14 of the book which is as ray is getting ready to go off on one of his adventures so i think that that one is probably the easiest to say like this is what they were going for so that is it for the dharma bums now it's time to get on to the next book which is bird by bird by anne lamott 
Hello and welcome to my kitchen. So we are on to book two, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, which if you're a real eagle-eyed or eagle-eared fan, eagles aren't known for having good hearing, are they? What's known for having good hearing? Bats? I almost said elephants, but the, that's just because their ears are big. I mean cats, right? Cats have good hearing. Okay, so if you're a cat-eared fan of the show, what I'm trying to say is if you pay a lot of attention and you notice when this book is mentioned, then you probably actually remember it from season two, episode eight, where it said much more clearly, but we're not talking about season two, are we? We're only focusing on season one here. So yes, this book is mentioned in season one, episode two, very briefly. I hate losing bird by bird, coach. Good night, coach. Night, coach. It's super quick. I didn't notice it until prepping for this. So let's talk about it. Episode two of season one is called Biscuits because this is when we implement biscuits with the boss, which is why I'm coming to you from my kitchen because I'm going to be making the Ted Lasso biscuits. I found the recipe online, it looks super easy. And so hopefully it's good. Although it sounds like in season one, they actually weren't that good. At least that's what the uh, actress that plays Rebecca said. But anyways, that's what I'm going to be doing while talking about this book. You thought this was freshly read books? This is freshly baked biscuits as well. So Bird by Bird is the nonfiction and it's basically advice on writing and life in general. So I wasn't actually sure how I was gonna like feel about this book going into it just because I'm not big into writing, but since like knowing that I was going to be reading this book, I started noticing that a lot of people were talking about it and I've heard a lot of really great things about it. And I gotta say, those people were right. <laughs> like, it's a really good book. I completely recommend this, even if you're not a writer. Like, I got so much out of this and it made me wanna write. Like, it made me wanna write again. And I think that that's really cool. But basically, Anne Lamott uh, teaches writing classes. And so a lot of the advice in the book is advice that she gives to her students when she teaches, but also you get to hear a bit about her life. And then also just about how she thinks the advice that she has that has to do with writing could be carried over into advice just about life in general. General. So I think for this book, it's a little easier to talk about like why this is being brought up in Ted Lasso. The title is referenced, of course, but the title is specific to a certain instance, a certain story that is told within this book. And so it's really easy for us to know what Ted Lasso means by bird by bird. So not long into the book, we do get the story of where this bird by bird phrase comes from. 30 years ago, my brother, who was 10 years old at the time, was trying to get a report on birds written that he'd had three months to write, which was due the next day. We were out at our family cabin in Bolinas, and he was at the kitchen table close to tears, surrounded by binder paper and pencils and unopened books on birds, immobilized by the hugeness of the task ahead. Then my father sat down beside him, put his arm around my brother's shoulder, and said, bird by bird, buddy, just take it bird by bird. I love this sentiment. It's not one that is uncommon. There's also that expression that is, how do you eat an elephant? And that's one bite at a time, or a journey of a thousand steps begins with one step, something along those lines. So this is obviously something that is you know, common, I guess. But I do think that I like this version of it the best because just by saying bird by bird, you convey the whole message. And it's sweet to think of both Ted and Beard as having read the book, or at least one of them having read the book and liked it enough to talk to the other about it. It does lead me to wonder if either one of them is into writing and that's why they went towards this book to begin with, but I don't really write and I read it, so. <laughs> I also think that having it be brought up in the second episode is a great time for it because in this episode, it's the first time that we kind of see that Ted is struggling with this big change. I think it's easy to see him as being just so overly positive that nothing really phases him. He brings in biscuits that morning for the very first biscuits with the boss and he seems overly upbeat and it's not until he's standing on the sidelines with Coach Beard that we start to see those first signs of anxiety. And I think that that's really wonderful. A character that I easily can compare him to is Leslie Nope from Parks and Recreation. I love Parks and Recreation and I love Leslie Nope and I do think they did a great job of writing her. However, she does kind of seem like this overly superhuman character. Inside your bags, you will find a few things. A mosaic portrait of each of you made from the crushed bottles of your favorite diet soda. And a personalized 5,000 word essay of why you're all so awesome. And sometimes Ted can seem like that, but then you see the other side of it where he is struggling with these things. And so just the quote bird by bird on his first day of like real training, while he and Coach Beard are standing in front of this huge journey that they have ahead of them that they are fully committed to at this point. It's just, it's beautiful and it's a lovely way to set out the character. Anyways, now that I've just talked and uh, I think I've only softened butter and got out the bowls for this, I'm gonna go ahead and bake these biscuits and then I'll check back in to let you know how they are. 
episodes a few hours later. This took way longer than I thought it was going to, but here we have it. So it's a little bit like it's not it's not really sticking together, but I mean, for the most part, it's just like split down the middle, I guess. But I don't know, I feel like it's pretty accurate. Here we go. It's really good. It's so flaky, it's so nice. It's not too sweet. I'm in love. I love these. It's four ingredients. I do think that vanilla would be a nice addition to it. Anyways, that's Bird by Bird which means episode two is done and we can move on to episode three. And we... And we can move on to episode three, which is a episode that's packed with books because this is where we get the scene where Ted is giving the whole team a book each that is like tailor picked to that specific person. So the first one we are jumping to is Ender's Game, which is the book that he gives to Sam. And I've never read it, which it, uh, this seems exciting because I feel like a lot of people my age have read this book and loved it. So here we go. Actually, before we get into Ender's Game, I have a little tangent we need to go on because I want to talk about two books that are mentioned and that initially I was planning on reading for this video, but then I ended up deciding not to. I think I mentioned it in the intro, but honestly, I filmed that intro so long ago, I don't remember. But what I wanted to talk about was this little clip here. What if I joined forces with the swashbuckling cat, played tiny guitars for women of the night as we read Alex Haley's most seminal work? You'd be in cahoots with Puss in Boots, playing lutes for prostitutes, reading roots. No. The autobiography of Malcolm X, I got you. So I did end up purchasing both the autobiography of Malcolm X and Roots. Look at how big this is. So I had gotten these mostly because I really wanted to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I think it might be on my 100 books bucket list poster or I might be baking that up, but either way, I really wanted to read it. So I was like, oh, this will be a good excuse for it, which is the reasoning that I used for, I think like two books in this video that I didn't really need to read it to understand more about Ted Lasso, but I wanted to read them anyways. And it's fun to talk about in this type of video and this style and to use that to like talk more about the show. And I thought that this was gonna be kind of along those same lines. But then of course Roots showed up and I did not realize quite how big of a book it is And I would have literally just never finished this video or it would have been you know Well after the show had ended so yeah I can't be taking forever to just film this first video But in addition to that the thing they say about it is most seminal work Which is not something that you determine just by reading them That's something that you determine based off of how many people are talking about them So I thought that the better way to decide is to just google and see which book comes up first That's what I'm gonna do now. This is science. Okay so I think that actually Coach Beard was right. On Wikipedia, the first line to introduce who Alex Haley is contains the fact that he is the author of Roots. And yeah, even on biography.com, the title of it is Alex Haley, Roots, Books, and Quotes. Does that mean anything? No, not really. I guess it just means that the rhyme could have worked. We could have just stuck with Roots, but that wouldn't have been funny. So really all I'm doing is like zapping all the humor out of this joke by talking about it too much. Well, okay, you leave me here to think about that and you head on to the next book. Bye. Oh, where do I begin on this one? I didn't like it. It's really disappointing because this was the book that I was probably the most excited about reading for this video. I would say it's pretty influential as far as sci-fi's today go, and you can see that influence when reading it, but it just... I didn't think it was that good. So the main character, Ender, is really young at the start of this book, at, at like six years old or something ridiculous, maybe eight. You see him grow up throughout this and become like, I think a teenager age by the end of it, but you spend a good amount of time throughout that process of him growing up. But the way that he talks and thinks and acts never seems all that young. It seems like he's the age that he's at at the end for the entire thing. It made me continually second guess whether or not I understood how old he was supposed to be. It's very off-putting and it does make it feel like the passage of time isn't really happening except that it's telling you that it's happening. Also, it's incredibly repetitive. So at the beginning, Ender gets kind of pulled into this training place where he is supposed to be training to be able to fight these aliens because they're going to be fighting in zero gravity. So they need to figure out how to fight like in that space. And so Ender's one of the people that they pull in to do this. But there seems to be something that's special about Ender specifically. It alludes to that the entire time. And basically every chapter starts with these higher ups. I think they're 
generals or one of them's a general but either way they're like adults that are in this like training area place and every chapter starts with them being like i'm not sure if we can really do this but then what's the alternative i don't know it just seems really cruel to put a boy through this do we really even think he can handle it well if he can't handle it it's all over anyway so what's the difference that's every conversation. Not only that, but Ender is forced to join a bunch of different teams throughout this. So like he'll be on a team and he'll improve as a part of that. And then it'll get to a certain point where they will take him and they'll put him on a different team. So you like kind of start to get to know maybe one or two people that are a part of that original team. And then he'll get moved and you'll almost never see them again for quite some time anyway. And then he'll be on the second team. And then you'll like get to know like one person a little bit, barely any like backstories, non-existent. Who needs them? These people are just here and they exist and they have almost a personality. And then after a while on that team, he'll get put on another team. And it, it's just, it's repetitive. There is a little bit of difference thrown in there with his brother and sister because they're kind of doing their own thing back at home. But other than that, it, it stays in that like repetitive space for nearly the entire book. I still think that the ending has like a good, message and the ending is really good but I like won't be continuing in the series. As for why Ted gave this book to Sam, I think the most obvious connection that we can draw is the homesickness. At this point in the show, like when the books are given, the most we know about Sam is that he is new to the team and he's a far away from home. I think it's the first episode where they celebrate his birthday and they get him some snacks from home to like bring that connection in. So I think that Ted gave Sam Sam Ender's game in order to show somebody else that is struggling with being separated from home but the way that he is able to connect with new people in this new space. However, I do wish that this story had more of Ender connecting more with the people that existed at the training grounds at least earlier in the book because it takes quite some time until it really feels like those connections exist. But maybe that's part of the message. Like sometimes those things take time. I'm just glad it didn't take as long for Sam as it did for Ender in the book. Also, I've actually already filmed this entire clip, but the audio was awful. And the only reason why I bring that up is because in that clip, I tried Chin Chin, which is the snack that Sam specifically calls out as far as like his goodie bag of things for his birthday. I no longer have any of it, but I did capture technically when I tried that for the first time. I'm just going to voice over it now so that you don't have to have the absolute assault on your ears that is the audio from this section. Okay, so I got this Chin Chin online and it says that it's authentic. I'm not like sure if it is, but it, that's what it says right here. And oh, it's gonna be so good. I think, I haven't tried it yet. I guess let's just, let's open it and find out what it tastes like. It smells good. It smells, I don't know why that was funny. And mm, yum, yum, yum. Actually that tastes differently than I expected, but it's really good. Yes, very good. It was very crunchy. Uh, it's sweet, but not too sweet. I'm really trying my best to remember. <laughs> so yeah, that was me experiencing Jin Jin. As you can see, that bag was huge uh, and we have eaten all of it at this point. So clearly I liked it and so did Curtis. Anyways, now that we've done that, it's time for you to get on to the next book. I'll see you there. Oh, hey, it's me again. I'm saying that because I'm coming to you from, I just did the clip of the Alex Haley books, but now I'm gonna to talk to you about The Beautiful and the Damned. So this is the book that Ted gives to Jamie Tart in episode three. It's a fucking book. I do think it's funny that of the four books that we see given during that scene, three of them are like children's slash YA books. And one of them is an adult book. And not just an adult book, a classic. And it's given to Jamie Tart. Seriously? I mean, so sweet that Ted thought that Jamie would at all give this book the time of day. And of course we know that he didn't, he threw it right in the trash. So this book is about Gloria and Anthony who are living in the 20s and are doing like pretty all right for themselves, come from pretty well off families, don't really have to worry about anything, but as they are kind of working on creating their own lives and their own lives together, they start to struggle a bit more, times become a bit more tight, neither of them wants to work or do anything really. They even say like, I don't want to do anything. That being said, they do go to like a lot of parties and things, they enjoy buying things, but as far as work, I really do none of it. Anthony does try a bit to with like a writing career, but it's really not the effort that somebody 
would give if they were more used to the fact that you need to like work to survive. They tend to take a lot of what they have for granted, but also they have this mindset of while we're young, we need to enjoy life to the absolute fullest, which includes getting themselves like into debt and stuff. Because of this, they also kind of struggle to develop deep and meaningful relationships with other people because typically when they're spending time with other people, it's through these party situations where they can kind of get deep, but it's more of like a false sense of getting there and it's only brought on by alcohol. It's not like they are actually really connecting with these people. And I think that that makes life harder later for them because they don't have those core relationships in their life. So I feel like it's pretty clear to see why Ted gives this book to Jamie. It's basically this cautionary tale to think towards the future and to recognize the people that you have around you and to connect with them and to not feel like, you know, you're all that, you know, what's best, you know what you want in life, and it doesn't matter what anybody else wants, you're living fully for you. I think he's worried that Jamie's going to squander what he has by not really caring about anything and not caring about the people around him, thinking that he doesn't need anybody else in his life. There was one quote that I really loved and I wanted to point out. However, by the time she reappeared in the sitting room, he had explained himself to himself with sophistic satisfaction. I think that that's hilarious because it's basically saying that Anthony was like second guessing what he was doing and then given some time by himself he's like no I did the right thing <laughs> and I think that there's a lot of moments in this book where he kind of talks himself into believing that he did the right thing and I think that Jamie tends to do the same thing like he might second guess himself for a second and then he's like no I was right I will say that I think that Jamie is different from Gloria and Anthony in one really significant way and that's purely just his work ethic I think it's clear to say that Jamie does work really hard at what he does like yes he's very annoying about it but I don't think that he could reach the level that he's at without putting in a lot of hours into the training and learning that goes behind becoming a professional like sports player. So I don't think it's like a one-to-one -one comparison between like him and Anthony, but I do think that there is a purpose for Ted giving this to Jamie that is very apparent. Unfortunately, Jamie's not going to learn that at this point because he threw this book in the trash, so. It's a fucking book. So we actually have two books to talk about in this clip. The next one was Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, but I've also got A Wrinkle in Time here because I've already read A Wrinkle in Time. This is a really quick and easy reread for me. I think I'd read this multiple times growing up actually. And so I just got through it really quickly. And now I'm here to talk about both of these. And you're probably thinking that one of these I have a lot more to say about as it pertains to the show than the other. And you're right, but it's not the one you think. So instead of going straight to Peculiar Children, I'm actually gonna go to A Wrinkle in time first because I have less to say about it. The main reason for that being they do a great job in the show of explaining why this book was given to Roy and so it seems more pointless for me to extrapolate you know what I mean? So this book follows Meg, her younger brother Charles Wallace and also uh, there's another friend I can't remember his name right now. Oh it's Calvin. This book follows them as they journey through like space and time. This There's this ambiguous kind of villain that's called It and it seems so much greater and more powerful than just these three children, but specifically Meg, who is the protagonist of our story. And so just as is said in Ted Lasso, Meg represents Roy's need to accept that he is the one that needs to kind of lead this charge and be like a full leader. I mean, what even is a wrinkle in time? It's the story of a young girl's struggle with the burden of leadership as she journeys through space. Am I supposed to be the little girl? I like you to be. At the beginning of Ted Lasso, so he's kind of stagnant in that he, yes, is like the captain of this team, but I think that he kind of sits in that role feeling like, yeah, he deserves it because he's been playing for the longest. He has been a great player throughout his career, but not really seeing the responsibility that goes along with that. And throughout season one, we see him start to accept that responsibility, but we see him even reading to Phoebe and really coming to this realization. But it has to be me. It can't be anyone else. And we see him start to have influence not just within the actual playtime, but also within the more personal lives, like making sure that Nate doesn't get picked on as much. So that is A Wrinkle in Time. Now, <laughs> to get into Peculiar Children. So this book follows Jacob, who is really close with his grandfather, who kind of like spun all these crazy stories. And then after his grandfather like tragically dies, he and, as in Jacob, and his dad, his grandpa's son, they go to 
where his grandpa had been living for a while or like where a lot of the stories that he told kind of came from. And then Jacob in checking out this place, it kind of seems like maybe his grandfather exaggerated the stories a lot and that this stuff didn't really happen or that maybe he was using it to cover up some trauma that he had from the time period that it set in. But then Jacob starts to discover this other world almost. And so that's like the existence of the peculiar children. But anyways, we very barely see this book within Ted Lasso. So maybe you're thinking, how could you really talk much more about this book? After all, it's given to an unnamed player. But I really wish you wouldn't underestimate me like that. Yeah, well, maybe next time you will estimate me. So while I am 1000% grasping at straws here, I have done more research for this book and on this player that the book is given to than any other thing that I've done for this video. And why would I do that? Honestly, I'm not sure. It started as me just like trying to figure out what the name of the character was that got this book. I am pretty positive that his name is Roberts and he's number 16. And then that turned into me analyzing every scene that he was in for the entire season. <laughs> so here's the backstory that I've come up with. At first glance, I thought that Roberts was a starter for the team based off of the trainings whenever we see him. But then we get into episode five where Ted benches Jamie during a game and the person replacing him in the game is number 16, that's Roberts. Which would of course lead us to believe that he is not in fact a starter. So I've decided that he's on the brink of being a starter, but he's kind of struggling with whether or not he belongs there. Whenever he's just casually hanging out with teammates, he's typically hanging out with the reserves. At least that's who they are in season one. But he's often seen playing with the starters or the main characters. And even at that charity ball that Rebecca puts on, he's seated at that main table. So he goes between starting and being a reserve kind of like Jacob goes between worlds in Peculiar Children. And really he just needs to embrace the part of him that he has doubts in and just like go for it, release the doubts and go for it. Okay, that's my rant. I, honestly, I feel like a lot of people probably skimmed right on past this one. So if you didn't and you're still here, if you could just give a little shout out to Roberts or number 16 in the comments so that I know, because we believe in him, right? Also, I just want to say here, shout out to all the background characters in Ted Lasso. It wasn't until I was super fixated on everybody that was in the background of the scene trying to find Roberts everywhere that I realized just how good the acting was and how present everybody stays the entire time. Like this guy here, Ted leaves like halfway through the game to go up to ask Rebecca something. And this guy, you can like see him be like, man, what's going on? Like, where's he going? And also this celebration shot, I love so much because you get to see this scarf that gets thrown up perfectly into this scene. And it adds so much to just like watching the reaction of these people. It's just so nice. Also the beer celebration shot. Like that's what I envision now whenever I'm excited about anything. Like, like something really great happened and I'm like celebrating in my mind mentally, all I'm seeing is this scene. Honestly, this show just like fills my heart. I love it so much. Anyways, on to the next one. Hi, it's me again. I feel like this is the cleanup day where I come in and do all the little random clips that I just haven't done yet. And for this clip, we're going to be talking about a quick reference that is in the show, a reference to the book Fight Club by Chuck Palahniuk. So this book I actually read not that long ago, so I didn't include it in my stack, but I feel like I should have. Actually, I don't think I own the book anymore. But I should have mentioned it early on in this video because it was technically on the list, but I just forgot about it because I'd already read it. But I just wanted to take this moment to kind of recognize how great Ted Lasso as a show is at not having toxic masculinity, but also just recognizing toxic masculinity or recognizing the places in which men feel pressured to act or be a certain way and kind of knock down those barriers. So the reference for Fight Club is when a fight is kind of breaking out and Ted says that the first rule of his fight club is no fight club. Or actually as Coach Beard say it for him. Easy now. Coach tell these boys what the first rule of my fight club is. No fight club. No fight club. Okay. Which is a great way of just saying that like, that's not how we settle things. We're not settling things with fights here. We are settling it with talking, which we see Ted try to do in a number of instances between the teammates. But we also see a lot of conversations happen between different men that are in the show that are focused on their emotions, focused on how they're feeling. We have Sam that is really not afraid to say anything that might show what he's feeling emotionally. And really we only get glimpses of that in season one, but that continues 
continues to be the case later on. And he's never seen as like this weak character. He's seen as somebody that's very self-assured. We get it with the diamond dogs who are all so encouraging of each other, but also not afraid to call each other out in areas where they think that they're being silly. Grow up and get over it. The diamond dogs have struck again. <laughs> We also see disagreements within them, although I think that that comes more from season two, but the way that they go about those are largely very respectful. Also, I love that as a result of this, there are very few times when communication is at fault for an issue that is happening. And when it is, I think that it's a very believable instance. So it's not like this miscommunication where like somebody overheard somebody say something else and now they're like mad at that other person, which is a trope that we see again and again. But because the communication is so good throughout this show, it's very rarely the case. There are times in which characters don't talk and that does lead to issues later on. I feel like everybody knows what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say it because it's season two. We of course see Jamie who has the hardest time with letting other people in, but we also know that he had the biggest case of toxic masculinity in his life, at least that we know of, of the characters in his dad, who is kind of the stereotype of toxic masculinity. So it's understandable that Jamie is going to struggle in some of those areas. Now, of course, Fight Club as a book is really about that. It's about men using fighting to work through a lot of the things that they probably could work out by just talking to each other. And I think that some of the issues in that <laughs> would be resolved a lot quicker if there was more open communication. I'm not gonna fault it for that because that book is doing something completely different, but just to point it out. Also, if you want more of my thoughts on Fight Club, I do have a video specifically about it. So feel free to check that out. Anyways, on to the next book. It's been a while since the last clip that I filmed. <laughs> since I filmed that, uh, Ted Lasso season three has started. But anyways, a while ago, I finished the last two books that I had for this video, both of which had very small mentions within the show. And I actually don't even remember which one's first. I think it's this one first. So let's talk about Bridget Jones's Diary. This was a very cute book. It was fun to read and, you know, had like a bit of romance to it, obviously. I do think that it is a bit of a product of its time. No, it definitely is. It definitely is a product of its time. And I think some parts of that are like great and I enjoyed being in something that is was created in the time period that this was created in and then other things are like mm, I'm glad we like left that behind if that makes sense but it was cute it was fun and I believe the only reference to this book is Ted Lasso making a milk pun oh don't worry don't worry I'm gonna be an utter gentleman okay hey I wonder if they've ever seen the movie uh, Bridget Jones's Dairy. So like, did I need to read this for this video? Absolutely not. But why did I? Because I'd been meaning to read it. It's on my 100 books bucket list poster and I wanted to watch the movie. And so I read it and then I watched the movie and it was wonderful. I had a great time. I could totally see myself rewatching the movie. Some of the parts were very like cringy, uncomfortable, but purposely so, like they were created that way. So for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, this comes from a conversation that Ted and Coach Beard have. Tough time with Roy. Coach, you are a natural born caregiver. My chief from Cuckoo's Nest. It's always more of a Tabor guy. I haven't watched the movie, but I did do some research into it after this because I was surprised that Coach Beard had picked a character that I didn't really remember. I was assuming it would be like a main, main character. However, the character that he did pick is just like a bit more chaotic, a bit more rebellious. And of course, Ted Lasso picked a very silent, but very caring character in chief. So I feel like that makes sense. So this takes place in a mental ward and we see the entire story through chief who almost never speaks. And there is a new person that comes in named McMurphy. He kind of shakes things up and there's almost this like battle for power from the inmates and the like nurses that are taking care taking care of people. They're not doing the best job. It's really great. And I do understand why this book has had so much staying power. And this is another book that was on my 100 books bucket list. So that's two books in this video that I got to cross off that thing, which is maybe why, even though there are very small references, I still chose to read them. Anything to help me in getting through a list, right? I love lists too much. Lists have too much power over me. Anyways, what I would say Coach Beard would be, I think he's kind of a mixture of the two. And I think that it really depends on what setting Beard is in. Like he kind of stays at Chief's level until pushed 
or until put in a scenario that brings him into a more chaotic level. And speaking of Coach Beard, I did not want to end this video without talking more about the books that he reads throughout the season. Because he reads a lot. He's seen reading Inverting the Pyramid, I think twice for sure on the airplane on the way over. He also has a framed picture of the Pyramid of Success, which comes from Coach Wooden's Pyramid of Success, is that what it's called? Something like that. And then another one we see him reading is Silent Genius. So I actually listened to the first part of all three of the audiobooks for those. Just to try to get a better sense of Coach Beard, my initial plan was to actually listen fully to at least one of them. I was thinking Silent Genius since that was the one that most appealed to me. It seemed less about the game and more about Bob Paisley, but it was just not connecting with me. But I think it is important to see Coach Beard doing this, doing the research and really learning about the sport that they are getting into coaching despite not having coached it before. Whereas for Ted, we see him reading a novel and we see him giving novels because Ted is more about the emotional side, the feeling side, the people side of the sport. Whereas Coach Beard is really into all of the facts and the information about the sport. He knows so much about it already as they get there. He knows the lingo. He's able to walk Ted through this because of how much he's read. Presumably he has also read quite a few novels considering they both clearly have an understanding of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but they could have just seen the movie. But the one reference that is definitely to a book and not a movie that we see them both have is Bird by Bird, which is another of the nonfiction books. So I am curious to know how much Coach Beard reads novels or if he's always sticking to that nonfiction space. So we'll have to investigate perhaps further in future seasons. I think Silent Genius makes a lot of sense for having Coach Beard read because I think that he would relate a lot to Bob Paisley based off of the little bit of that book that I read. He's just so much a man that is more about showing rather than just telling. He says exactly Exactly what he means and never less or more than he means. And now we got Crystal Powell's coming here on Saturday. Anything we need to know, coach? A lot of speed on the outside. Okay. Anything else? A lot of speed. But yes, that's my little Coach Beard tangent. And that is it for the video. I feel like I've been making this video for a really long time and I know I'm still going to be editing it for much longer. But man, I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you've watched to this point, I assume you have. Please let me know in the comments or by liking. I don't think I've ever asked anybody to like a video before, but it seems very important for this one. Let me know if you would like me to do season two and read all of the books mentioned there. And then after that, we'll talk about season three. I'm so excited. I'm just so happy that Ted Lasso's back. I'm so excited to see the conclusion of the entire show. It's a great time. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, consider subscribing and I will see you in the next one. Bye. What do I do with my life now?